Hey guys, it's Red Wagner. This week's episode is part two of our discussion with Colby Keller. In this episode, we discuss the nature of art, interesting things to do at the gravesite of Joseph McCarthy, and what it would take to transition from capitalism to socialism. Additionally, this is only part two, and there is still more Colby content. Turns out Colby puts out a lot of usable content. Take that however you will. What this means is there might be a third Colby episode, and I haven't gone through all of the material to to make sure that that's a possibility, so no promises at this point, but it is possible. With that, let's turn to the episode. Who controls the means of production? Not me! Not you! the question i thought i was flabbergasted by it because first of all if your work has any meant any physical labor to it whatsoever it's true for everyone whether whether you work in adult entertainment or whether you are you know sweeping floors you're using your body to do that and you're literally renting yourself to your employer to to, to be the, the sack of meat that does the thing that they want the sack of meat to do. Yeah. In, in, including, I mean, even mental labor. You're, I mean, your brain is part of your body. Yeah. You're, you're literally turning your, your brain, which is part of your body, in it, into a commodity. So I thought it was just the weirdest damn question to ask because myself, identifying as a Marxist, I thought that's what everyone does. Yeah. Well, it's funny to me because, like, I worked those other two jobs. I've had a lot of jobs. And, man, like, the job at Neiman Marcus, like, or even the camera job, like, I still have a divot in my shoulder from that camera. Nothing beat up my body more than those two jobs. (laughs) Porn is giving me enough, like, control over what it is that I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there exploitation there? I mean, of course there is. (laughs) You know, every, every worker is exploited. And there definitely is a lot of that in porn and a lot of it that I can't control. But like, I do feel like I have like, it's an, it's a better job, I think in an easier job than, you know, working nine to five every day, you Mm -hmm. know, and I appreciate that about porn. Like it's, it's done a lot for me. That's good. I have to say, um, and much better than the jobs I had before, which, you know, people might see and recognize as being like, you know, good jobs <laughs> or like cool jobs, like the camera job. Like I tell people about that one. They're like, Oh, that's cool. Like I was almost the guy they wanted to hire me to be the guy in the helicopter that like does the traffic report. Miserable job, miserable, miserable job. <laughs> they actually weren't it even sounds fun to go on a helicopter. Sounds fun. Right. But, and like really yeah. impressive, but they weren't even going to pay me enough to, they were going to pay me $10 an hour. The job was only three hours a day. <laughs> And the airport was an hour and a half from my house. So I'm like, th- like I'm not even getting enough gas money to like go to the job to do like what? 
And they just thought I would accept it because they're like, well, you know, like you're going to be the traffic guy. You know? mm-hmm. So like they're counting on me just wanting the prestige, I guess, or like the cool factor that you get. I don't know what, what you get from that, but like they yeah. were. You may starve, would... but you do it with style. I, right. Yeah. <laughs> I bet that works a lot. Oh, I think uh, it does. Yeah. I bet that's all a lot. I think that's all a lot of people push themselves through shitty jobs or like internships or something like what bank was that that an intern died after working 72 straight hours? He had like a heart attack or something. Oh, it was like really? Citibank or Bank of America or something like that. So they've now reduced it to them only working like 17 hours a day or something like that. Hmm. Types of things. I remember seeing the press release after it and I thought, they're not trying very hard. They basically, they were, they were like, look, don't work yourself to death, but get really close. Yeah. <laughs> was, was what I took away from their their program that they instituted after someone had literally already died wow. of overwork. Well, the funny thing about gay porn and the reason I probably like get a, it's not a lot of money in it. Like I get paid less now than I did when I started, which was over 10 years ago, but because it's gay porn and most gay porn models are straight men, uh-huh. like the pay is much better than it would be even in straight porn. Oh, most so because it's difficult work for a lot of people, <laughs> like, means that it's like better pay for me. Huh. Unfortunately, like if you think of it that way. Sure. A lot of gay porn models are straight. I'd say probably about sixty percent, sixty to seventy percent, maybe. Huh. Yeah. I never would have guessed. No. 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 Are they doing a lot just of just solo stuff? Or? Oh no! Like no, okay. full, full on sex. Okay. Just because <laughs> more straight guys want to. Career in porn, or I want to. Or does it they'll, just they'll make often, it makes They'll more often money. be bottoms because it's uh, they don't have to get erections. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, makes sense. Because it's a lot of money. I mean, it can be like, you know, hmm. it could be like a works a uh, week's work uh, worth of you know wages huh. for six hours of work. Hey, that's it's not a bad deal. Yeah. Although you, the, they probably don't want to talk about work very much, like when they're hanging out with their friends or whatever. Well, I don't know if that's true. Actually, I think like I've met some guys, and like just the fact that they do porn, like uh-huh. if you're, you know, I don't know they're pretty you're much, both straight dudes, yeah. <laughs> like they with their friends, like it's just cool that they do it. Like it's very different, and uh, they, it's yeah. like it's harder to actually find gay men who will do porn hmm. because you know their friends will talk about them and like. Uh. You know, there's a lot more like uh, it becomes just worry. So, like, if you're straight, it just becomes work, and then you leave right. it at work, and it's yeah, huh? Yeah. Interesting. And straight porn for men does not pay at all. Like, you don't get paid anything. I believe that they probably don't even have to put up a fucking uh, casting call for that. Right. It's, it's it's like the helicopter, but even better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the and prestige. E- <laughs> and even women don't get paid very much, from what I understand. Huh. Really? Unless you're a big star, you really don't. Hmm. Huh. I know that like some companies, there are a lot of women who will get like an agent. I think they fly themselves. They spend their own money to fly to L.A. And now they go probably to Vegas. Um, they'll stay in a house. They have to pay rent on the house. They'll be in a house with probably like five to ten other female porn stars and they'll just get booked as much as they can. So like you might work like every day for like two weeks and then eventually you get burnt out because you've done so many scenes. No one wants to see you anymore and they ship you back home. The I was Jeez. surprised when um, I, I learned about the stripping industry is – Kind of similar in the sense that I I thought like it was going to be a lot better money than it was and like the whole structure of the industry is just awful. Like yeah. I, I was flabbergasted when I learned that strippers, uh, female strippers, pay to have time on the stage. Yeah, and and that they don't have benefits because they're an independent contractor. Like they're an mm. independent contractor that contracts with the club. They're not employed by the club. There's like all these like nasty like. The standard capitalist thing, I don't know why I didn't think about it, but I, I, when I learned about it, I was surprised. Well, it's because they're it up there and people are literally throwing money at them, so you don't go, oh, well, that must cost them money to stand up there and have people throw money at you. Yeah. It seems yeah. Very, it's very counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a question for you. So the art project you're doing now, it's very collaborative. Is that something like... 
do you see that as possibly like a way to build the left movement through art or an uh, artistic component to a left movement? Big collaborative projects throughout the country? Is there, is there a movement building potential behind? There That's is, and I think you see a lot more of that in the art world. Like particularly now, there are a lot of collectives or people that work in social. It's called a social practice. It's a much more common thing now in the art world. You also have like the classic corporate model. With, there are a lot of art stars who you know get really big, and then they just hire like ten assistants, and the assistants make everything, and it's kind of like a small scale, like a small business model. Mm -hmm. um, that's very common. Honestly, with this, it was partly out of necessity because I couldn't finish the project without the help of a lot of people. And also just it's my own values. Like I don't feel – I'm kind of averse to object production as an artist. So uh, that's something that I've, I've struggled with. Um, I have problems with like the way uh, art functions in the marketplace you know i have i've had a challenge like integrating what it is that i have to do to earn money to, to like put food in my face and my art practice so this was a way to kind of like play with those ideas and see what's possible what works what doesn't it's not in an intentional way to like build a movement i mean a small movement with the people that i'm working with hopefully and that's about intimacy and respect and you know seeing what's possible i think but I don't know like if it translates on a different scale or uh, I don't even know. It remains to be seen if it's working, you know. <laughs> There's always that question too. Well, There's different terms that people talk about these things in, right? The, you can say a collaborative project, which, you know, has one connotation. But then to say it's not a capitalist project, it's a project that involves you know, communist production relationship, that's going to have a very different meaning for most people. Most people don't think of collaborative and communist as the same thing. Right, it's yeah. And I don't know if they are. Like, I don't know what the definition of that would be. For, but, for me, like, communism is always, like, the horizon, right? It's, like, mm -hmm. the thing you actually can't re readily define. It's, like, the you're working towards it. Like, you should have some objective to work yeah. towards, but we can't know what that thing is. And... The project also does try to replicate that. Like, I don't know what the end of the result of the project will be. Like, I don't even know what will happen in Wisconsin. And I don't really want to know until it happens, which is really difficult for a lot of people to put their, their minds around. Like, you don't have a plan? Well, what are you doing after that? Well, what are you going to do from – what's your job going to be after this project's over? Well, how are you going to make money? Even recently I was in North Dakota at a, his, his family's farm – this was his aunt's farm. She's like in her 70s. And they were asking about the project. And they didn't know it involved porn, but like it was basically telling them what it was. And um, the the man, who's like a farmer, very hardworking, like, you know, farmer, uh -huh. he um, he asked me this question at dinner. He's like, well, did you see anything today that that, you know, you would consider to be art? Oh. And it was funny because like I had actually like been on their farm and his wife gave us a tour of their garden and they um they take rocks from their field um probably came from glaciers and they they cut them up into thin slices and then I guess as a way to kind of justify the process of doing this they have to cut them into shapes of like animals. Huh. So she has like huh. cats and dogs and and then they go around and they um, build these walkways out of concrete and they insert the stones in the walkway. And she has like this like dollhouse. She's like in her seventies, but has this like dollhouse that she like goes to sort of read magazines in. Huh. And I'm looking at all this and I'm like, this is really like an art project you got going here. Like you got all of the like the elements here of an art project. So I decided to be really frank with him. I'm like, he might not get this, but I'm just going to tell him. I'm like, actually, yeah, I think what you do with your fo your farm is like, you know, like in some ways is a piece of art. And I really respect it. And I think it's beautiful in a lot of ways. And I'm telling him this and I'm thinking like, this is such a great compliment I'm giving him, right? <laughs> and then he just like, his mouth is open. And he just like looks completely dumbfounded. And he's like, well, but w what would you paint? Ha, 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 ha,
<laughs> and it's this idea that like it has to be this object that is something known, which is like a painting or a drawing or a photograph, which can then be sold for money. Yeah. So that like uh, the only reason someone would ever make art is to like make money from it, right? Yeah. And and then I'm like, well, you guys are doing this. You're doing it, and you're not even knowing it. You're not calling it that, but like you're doing it. Uh huh. And you're not giving it the like the value, the justice it deserves, which is to like you know think of it in terms of this like other process, which is elevated in our culture, right? Like art is this elite thing, mm -hmm. and they're doing it on their farm, like they're artists too, you know. But like they can't give themselves that power. It has to be about like a market exchange. Hmm. I think it's really hard for people. A lot of people like. Capitalism has just gotten into every little like nook and cranny of people's brains and they can't think of a world outside of it. Yeah. And and even when they do, they don't necessarily even recognize it. You know, the like the idea of yeah. of of rejecting the employer relationship and, and engaging in collaborative work. You know, so, some people would look at that and say that that Colby is really a capitalist entrepreneur. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? People you no, know, people think that and they think I have a lot like all run into people and they just think I have a ton of money and that like I must be making all this money off of these videos and I'm like, You have no idea how like <laughs> as poor as can be. <laughs> like I literally it's not even paycheck to paycheck. It's like I just been praying somebody out there sends me some money, you know? <laughs> and like I'm living in a car. You got like, you have no idea. And but people have some strange notions about and they don't get it, too. They're like, well, then, if that's the case, why would you do it? You know? And I think there is a question there maybe about socialism, like, because it might not mean that, for instance, in the United States, that you would have, like, there's really comfortable middle class. You know, it might mean that, like, the standard of living might be lower for everybody. But everybody has something. And to say that there's like a there's something you give up to to give that to someone else like that in and of itself is a value that we should that we should think of as a good. Yeah, I always get into especially with in Wisconsin here they get in rid of unions and stuff. I always have this argument with people. In fact, I had this argument with my mother the other day because uh, she's quitting her union because she doesn't see what the benefit is to her. Right. And I'm like, well, it's. You you pay your due and you expect something to happen. It's a union or any sort of it's a collective thing. You get into right. it what you give. If everybody pays money and just expects things to magically happen, you don't get anything. Right. You need to work for it. It's, you have to understand what the point of it is. I, mean, I think, yeah, that's something that's very... Well, lost. the labor movement in the United States has also betrayed workers. Well, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, like, even on just, like, the foundational level, like, she complained, you know, like, they'll complain about, like, the union rep for that. I'm like, well, did you vote for the union rep? Did you run for union rep? Like, right, yeah. did you complain about it? Like, have you done something to do something about, you know, the most minimal amount? But yeah, it's, yeah. But yeah, I agree. The way unions are set up here, it's the National Labor Relations Board, it basically... Basically ensures that all unions are completely handicapped. Yeah, and that's historical. Like they deliberately cut out left-leaning labor organizers. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, there's well, been a war on the left, project. an intense war against the left in the United States for like you know what, seventy years? Yeah. Oh yeah. But, oh, longer than that. I yeah. Think. Cause Unfortunately, like, McCarthy, Joe McCarthy. You know what state he's from? Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that should be part of your project. You should oh, go up to Appleton, Wisconsin I should. and take a piss on McCarthy's grave <laughs> because that's something you can How do. How far away here. is it? Is it close it's, by? Uh, uh, oh, it might be two hours. Yeah, it's not oh, close. Man, I yeah. should do that. That's a good <laughs> idea. I like that idea. Or just have sex on top of his grave. Oh, <laughs> oh I think I'm sure his ghost would appreciate that. Nice. What you're saying, too, about what the people not uh, understanding the art project for, because it isn't like to find, like, I was yesterday out uh, having some drinks with friends and discussing uh, socialism with mm -hmm. them, because I never shut up about politics. And my friend's wife was like, well, what would it be like? I'm like, mm, yeah, it depends. Like, here are some ideas. Well, how would you do this? Like, I don't know. You got to figure it out when you get, like, you can't. 
you know, it's just the very, that exact problem is, you know, it's, you can't figure, like, you can try and figure some stuff out and plan ahead, and it's good to have some sort of idea as to, you know, what form or whatnot, something like that will take, but, yeah, I think that's the biggest barrier for the movement on the left is people don't like being told, yeah, we'll figure it out, we can figure some out, don't worry, it'll be good, you know, like, or if not, you know, that's the other thing that people don't realize with that is, it's, you know, it's like the union thing. It's as good as you make it. Like, if everybody works hard towards it, it could be really amazing. It'd, be, right. it'd well, certainly be better than what we have now. Well, and I think you gotta you got to recognize, like, the level of the conversation that's going on or, or maybe find some way to communicate that to the audience, too, because... You know, if you if you imagine someone saying, "Guys, I've got this idea for a thing called capitalism," and your fellow serfs are like, "What? What? What's it going to be like?" You know, it's like, "Well, there's lots of ways this whole capitalism thing could go." <laughs> it turns out there's more than one way to do capitalism. It's kind of at that same level when you're talking about socialism or communism or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I suppose if I am ever like if people at work complain about stuff, I'm like. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we just all elected who was in charge of us, and then we just decided what we do with all this money we know they're making off of us? Like, oh, yeah, that would be nice. I'm like, okay, we should do that. Oh, no, that wouldn't work. All right, fine. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think a problem, too, is not just, um, like, people that are unaware of what it is, but it's also people who are kind of educated and who might consider themselves to be part of, like, like liberals, for instance. Mm -hmm is that like postmodernism has kind of eaten away at our ability to claim any kind of truth position. Mm -hmm. So to say that there is like a good or that there's like an ethical position we can all agree upon is something that like fundamentally like those groups that that, those people are very like uncomfortable with allergic to it. Yeah. Really allergic to it without realizing that like that's, that is like a a right wing kind of strategy to undermine our ability to like improve the world. Like they're basically saying it's impossible. So capitalism is the only thing we can do. Mm -hmm. And that I think is maybe the biggest challenge is like addressing that core problem. And it really does make people apathetic. It prevents people from really organizing around an issue. Like we can we can organize around small issues like gay marriage, but like is there really a way to unify people across the board on a kind of ethical framework that deals with some kind of fundamental truth? Because when you don't believe in truth, it's hard to motivate people to support it. Uh, it just makes me wonder, going back to a conversation that we didn't record about Greece and Syriza, I really want and I really am concerned at how much that could hurt the left, like, for how that's playing out so far. Syriza, yeah, I think it's bad for the left. Yeah. Well, with the way it's gone, yeah. Yeah. This episode is probably going to come out after our Greek episode, where we made some predictions, and... I think we're, we're we're pretty much pretty disappointed at this point at the time of this recording, which is what Tuesday the fourteenth. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Could it? Uh, yeah, it's demoralizing. It's it's what it says to people is you can come out and you can make a stand and you can vote for Syriza and then you can s- vote for a no on the referendum, no to austerity, and guess what? You still get austerity. No matter what you do, there's always still austerity. It basically says to people you can do whatever you want, but it's always going to play out as however the, the financial institutions, the capitalists, those in power want. So I have like a a devil's advocate situation. Go for it. (laughs) Which is um, capitalism obviously like requires constant growth, right? Mm -hmm. But we do have limited resources on the planet and we have a growing human population. So that's not really a possibility. Mm -hmm. And the only way that that's possible is if there's kind of a colonial situation where one power is taking advantage and exploiting others globally. So if there is some kind of global consensus that that needs to change, that would mean that people in the West, their living standard would need to lower. So like you could make an argument that there is some kind of subversive process to like hurt <laughs> workers in a way to bring that pot, the, 
You know, I'm the devil's advocate here. I don't oh, know if oh, I agree great. with it. <laughs> oh, okay. I, just so I understand right. your position, you're saying that the implementation of austerity will lower the standard of living for workers right. in the West. That the standard of is... living in Greece was actually unsustainable. Mm. Mm. And that it is across Europe and it's unsustainable in the United States as well. So that the only way to like bring us to where we need to be is to bring in austerity as a measure to... It could be. I mean, that that's... So I think that I have a hard time making uh, or or coming to uh, a prediction as to whether or not a socialist system could raise or lower, because I think both are possible, could raise or lower the, the standard of living for your average worker. Um, because I think, like you mentioned, if there's a big disparity between the first world and the third world, that's, I think, the best argument for it could lower, because if you even it all out, that's going to lower everything. But there's also a ton of different contradictions within the capitalist system, a ton of different inefficiencies. Yeah. When, when you look at um, most of the products that you buy, you know, if I go out and buy a tube of toothpaste, the amount of money spent on advertising for that toothpaste makes up way more than any amount spent on the actual production of that toothpaste, which is the case for most of our commodities. So I, right. there's a good argument, I think, on that side, too, for if you got rid of all that idiotic capitalist propaganda, marketing, those kind of things, if you had society organized in a rational manner, I think there's some gains to be made. Now, are the gains bigger or are the losses bigger from evening things out across the world? I don't know. Well, I think for me, like the lesson of history, though, is that it's not possible to build socialism in one country, right? Mm -hmm, Which yeah. was what the Soviet Union was trying to do. Did not work for the main reason that like the Soviet Union was under constant pressure and assault from the capitalist West and had its own internal problems mm -hmm. like that, that undermined whatever it was trying to accomplish. And... Um, but partly for that reason, like, you know, I think there was a realization that socialism could not compete. If there's a, if you're competing, if you're putting like socialism against capitalism, capitalism might be like a much more, uh, might have ethical problems. Like there might be a lot of worker abuse. Like it might be much worse for the world, but like ultimately like there's something in it that accumulates resources, right? Like it's really efficient at doing that. So the only way socialism can come into being is really through, a, like, if there's a totality that can be achieved on the entire planet where capitalism is entirely <laughs> discredited and dissolved. And, like, to be able to do that, like, cre you really need, like, a really great strategy to undermine capitalism or do you let capitalism dissolve itself. Right, which is what Marx would have predicted that it, mm -hmm. it's going to undo itself. In which case, like having a social oppressive socialist state in 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 existence, like the USSR or like communist China when it was you know a socialist country, like actually undermines the idea of socialism by producing what it can only can only produce, which is a really bad version of that thing. Mm -hmm. So why not just be capitalist, be a capitalist country like China and like let capitalism like run itself into the ground, full steam ahead? Yeah, I mean that might be the way it plays out. I also wonder too. With the part of the thing about those is, I really wish we could see an act, a very industrialized nation have some sort of a communist revolution or socialist revolution because right. that's the other you know the other thing about those two countries they're both basically going from feudalism right yeah and that i mean obviously has hampered them but yeah i don't know if they even pot like if the united well maybe the united states because of its unique position in the world economic stuff <laughs> with its unique <laughs> position in the, in the world economy maybe that would be big enough but yeah like say um, the failed Spartacus uprising, like if that would have actually happened, if Luxembourg and Liebknecht would have been able to overthrow Germany, would that have made things different? Would that have been enough? Yeah, I don't know. 
I, I, I think at that wonder. point in the world, like that, that may have actually changed something. That was the the jewel, and the crown was Germany. It was always Germany because mm-hmm. they were the economic powerhouse. That's really why Stalin wanted Poland so that he could get to Germany. Because um, if you capture Germany, you've got Europe, and if you've got Europe, you have a good chance of extinguishing capitalism. Problem is the United States, and the United States used World War II to its advantage to like become a superpower. And to be the standard bearer for capitalism in the world, which we do a good job of. Yeah. Know? And so now we are both like, I think maybe, like you said, the best positioned country to actually like realize something like socialism. But we're also the biggest obstacle to that. This might not be a popular position amongst other Marxists. For a long time, I had the same position that you were mentioning before, Colby, that that uh, there, when you line them up, capitalism and socialism, uh, and they compete against each other economically, that capitalism is going to win. And so what we need to have is to win everyone's, essentially, hearts and minds over to socialism to make, to make that work out. You know, if you try to have an economic comp- competition between the two, that socialism can never win. I'm, I think, changing my mind on that now. In, in, in this sense, I think that a, a few things come together here. One, I think that when workers work cooperatively, I think that there's a certain amount of productivity gains that can be achieved there that may not necessarily be possible under capitalism. Like, for example, one of the reasons that I believe the United States got rid of slavery and why slavery was finally abolished was because capitalism was just straight up more productive. Like, it turns out when you have a little bit of education with your workers and they can be fired and things like that, that they work differently than a slave works. Like, slaves aren't particularly good at taking care of machinery that they work with and things like that, whereas the the capitalist system was was better suited for that technology to be more productive. I think at this time, we now have a certain level of technological advancement where capitalism is hindering technological advancement. Where, for example, like when, when uh, we shut down Napster and we try to, you know, charge you a buck per song on iTunes, we're enforcing an out, old, outdated, commodity-based model on a world where our technology has moved beyond it. And I don't know exactly how a socialist uh, country can compete blow for blow on a capitalist against a capitalist country against it, but I see the uh, the beginning of a change there, where where capitalism is actually becoming a hindrance to productivity, and socialism actually has the benefit on some of these. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think actually, like, even if you look at a country like the Soviet Union, and obviously China, like, you know, the Soviet Union, which has, like, really kind of small, it's a big country, had a lot of resources, but, like, small population, um, achieved a great deal. Like, I mean, we landed on the moon only because of the Soviet Union, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's the power of, you know, state capitalism, really, which is what the Soviet (laughs) Union practiced, like, it was not socialism. Maybe some parts of it were. Like, we have to be honest about that. And it was really efficient. But there's also, like, a bigger question as to whether, like, it works as well ideologically. Capitalism, like, the the American dream is, like, the best propaganda that's ever been put on the face of the earth. Totally not true, like, at all for any any human being. But, like, a lot of people want to believe in it. Like, everyone wants to believe they're going to get rich and have a comfortable life and their children will have a comfortable life. And, like, if they work hard, they'll be, like, rewarded. And it's really hard to compete with that idea. Yeah. One of the new opiates of the masses. It really is. I think so. Socialism can actually is, is better for people and probably more efficient. The other thing, though, is that like it, the way it was articulated in uh, in Russia, in China, and a lot of countries, it was an oppressive, demeaning system, and it didn't give people pleasure. There wasn't a way to find pleasure in that. Like you didn't you didn't anticipate the idea of change and transformation and think of it as a pleasurable thing. And capitalism, like, is erotic. It's charged. 
you know, it, you know, we're constantly craving things. We don't get that pleasure. So we try to seek it out in something else. That searching might be bad for people, but like it does keep you engaged in it Mm -hmm. and keeps you in that system, keeps you craving. Like we all get addicted to things. We're all addicts, you know, and it works in that sense. Like it doesn't help people, but it does work ideologically. It works in the fact that it, you know, it's creating a type of pleasure that is keeping it so far, like still in existence. Yeah. Yeah. It taps into our primordial selves, our need for, you know, our drive to get stuff because we just need to survive. And they've figured out how to tap into that. And they use that same biological, just base drive to drive us towards right. capitalism. Yeah, exactly. And and if you think ourselves. of sex, if you think of porn, you know, what's a sex fantasy is usually the thing you're, it's not good for you, right? The thing you're like, <laughs> you're not supposed to do. And because you're not supposed to do it, like it gives you this erotic charge. Mm. And that's kind of what capitalism taps into. Yeah. Socialism, like, oh, it's the thing that's good for you. It's good for everybody. We should do it. It's like not, yeah. There's not a drive or pleasure that's attached to that notion. Yeah. And that's the problem. And I think that's the thing that the left really needs to work on. And I think you're saying that socialism is the broccoli. Yeah. Capitalism it's the is broccoli. the chicken wings. Or no, or like the, the red velvet cake. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, what do you want? Like, if you have those two, I actually prefer the broccoli, but like, you know. Depends on how it's done up. This is, this is true. And like, I do like it with a lot of butter. I will say that. But like... <laughs> Yeah, like it's a challenge and and it's one of those things where like if that that idea exists in the world somewhere like capitalism like as a force it has more power to it as an idea than the good thing, right? So that's the problem. Like you kind of have to extinguish it. Mm. And if there are a few people that have money, like they will use it, you know. Yeah. And then like they have more power. Socialism, like, should be about liberation, emancipation, like, freeing human beings, like, freeing the human mind, not, like, letting someone else determine for you, like, what you should buy and put in your body and, like, who you should have sex with. And socialism, as it was articulated in the Soviet Union and in China, was always on a military – it was almost like it was always, like, if you think about – you know, an an emergency situation where the military has to come into power, Mm -hmm. like, that's what – that was yeah war communism yeah and it was it had to be like constantly at war and so like and people like honestly like put up with it for a long time because they believed in that idea like it did motivate people like a large part of the population was motivated by that idea until it got to be like too much because like how are we going to be how long are we going to be at war like my grandkids are at war my great grandkids are at war like when do we decide like enough is enough Mm mm-hmm and that becomes like the question, like you know, to make that idea both like better for people, but also exciting and fun and emancipating at the same time. Who controls the means of production? It's me. It's you. Who controls the means of production? Not us. Not us. Who controls the means of production? It's me. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.